Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for those of you here in Washington, D.C. who braved this hot morning. Uh, we, uh, we really did miss out on spring this year. We were right into summer. And thanks to those of you tuning in online or watching the replay. Uh, great to have you with us. My name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. For those of you that don't know too much about us, uh, we are an education policy think tank here in Washington, D.C., doing a lot of policy research and commentary and all the big education reform issues of the day. What you may not know is that we also do work in our home state of Ohio. Thomas B. Fordham was a wealthy industrialist back in the 20s and 30s, and uh, the money that he left was, was made in Dayton, Ohio. So we have an office in Dayton and another office in Columbus. Uh, out of Dayton, we are a charter school authorizer. Uh, Ohio's uh, unusual charter school law allows nonprofits to play that role. And we oversee about a dozen schools throughout the state in all the big cities, including uh, Kip Columbus uh, and some other very uh, high-performing charter schools. Uh, and then out of, in Columbus, we do a lot of policy advocacy work, including trying to improve Ohio's charter school sector, uh, defend accountability, and other things. So uh, it should be obvious, then, that we are big fans of charter schools. Uh, and we are going to talk today about charter school deserts. Uh, we're going to start, I will go through a little bit of background on a study we put out on this topic, and then we've got a great panel to talk about how this is playing out in a few localities, specifically here in Washington, D.C., and also in Denver, Colorado. I, I should be upfront about this, that we are obviously fans of charter schools, especially high-quality charter schools. This is not going to be a debate on the pros and cons of charter schools. We have had those debates at times uh, at forum events. Uh, but but not today. Uh, and and I would just posit that what we know now from very rigorous evidence from Credo uh, and other studies is that urban charter schools, especially those schools serving, uh, serving low-income kids, uh, have been getting very strong results. Uh, they've been getting better over time, uh, and they are the kind of results that, for the very best charter schools, really are changing kids' lives and changing their trajectories. As we start to get more and more data about long-term impacts of high-quality urban charter schools, uh, it's, it's even more impressive. You know, increasing high school graduation, but also college going and college completion, a few studies that can even look beyond that uh, into earnings, uh, the picture looks very good. Uh, again, if you do it right, uh, and particularly for schools that are serving low-income kids. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that the growth in charter schools has slowed dramatically in the last few years. Uh, and uh, it you know, seemed like it was going gangbusters back in the race to the top years, 2013, 14, and so forth. And it's really slowed down dramatically in the last few years. So for those of us that believe that high-quality charter schools can provide these life-changing opportunities for young people, especially kids growing up in poverty, this is a problem. Uh, and there's a big debate happening in the charter school movement about why that might be. What is slowing things down? Is it politics? Uh, is it funding? You know, is it uh, facilities uh, and, and the like? And I think the, the answer is it's all of those things. And of course, it, it plays out differently in every community in the country. But one possibility is that in a lot of big cities, we may have reached a point of, of some market saturation. You look at a place like Washington, D.C., now almost 50% of kids are in charter schools. By the way, charter schools that by and large are quite high performing. Look again, look at the Credo data, look at the latest NAEP results. Uh, you know, the, the charter schools here are just crushing it uh, for the most part. Uh, and it's a lot harder to start a charter school when you've already got you know, over 100 charter schools in the city that you have to compete with than it was back when uh, you were the, one of the only players in town. But it made us wonder at Fordham if, you know, if, if partly because we're here in D.C. and partly because most of us are so focused on big cities, are we missing a part of the picture? Are there places that have a high concentration of low-income families uh, but still no charter schools? And that's what gave rise to this study uh, about America's charter school deserts. We wanted the answer to that question. So, uh, we turned to a professor at the University of Miami of Ohio, Andy Saltz, who had done some studies previously uh, using mapping software to look at where charter schools are located. He did a great study in New York City, for example, looking at that and trying to understand why charters were missing from some neighborhoods or highly represented in others. And we asked him, hey, could we do this nationally? And, uh, and he tackled it, and we are very grateful for it. So let me go through and, and show you what we found, which was that, in fact, yes, there are quite a few of these communities out there. Now, the way we defined a charter school desert 
was that it had to be a place where there were uh, three or more uh, contiguous census tracts that were high poverty or at least medium poverty. I think our cutoff was 20% or higher in terms of the population in poverty, which is which is quite high. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you think about our national poverty rate, uh, you know, for children, I think right now is at about, what, 17%. So, you know, th these, are, these are high poverty neighborhoods uh, and places where there's no charter schools, okay? We tried to do our best to take out places that literally were deserts. <laughs> I think there might have been a few that snuck in there because, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. And there's a few other idiosyncrasies. Uh, for example, Scott Pearson, the head of the charter school board here in D.C., asked me, Mike, how do we, what are these charter school deserts in Ward 3 here in the district? This is not high poverty areas. Well, it turns out they were American University and George Washington University and Georgetown. Universities show up as low-income areas because kids don't have income. Uh, and so there are uh, some of those little idiosyncrasies. But even that said, we found about 500 of these deserts across the country. Uh, and they are in almost every single uh, state in the country that has a charter school law. There's just a handful that, that they don't exist in. So even in places that have tons of charter schools, you can still find these deserts uh, scattered about. And, in, and it's you know, more in some places than others. Uh, if you dig into the report on our website, what you'll see is an analysis for each state uh, with a bunch of maps where we go in and we look and we try to find out where these charter deserts are. Now, Tennessee is a good example here. Tennessee is a state that allows charter schools mostly in Nashville and in Memphis. All right? And you can see those, those, those are the dots that you see clustered in Nashville and Memphis. Uh, but, you know, as anybody from Tennessee knows, uh, poverty is much more widespread than that. It's spread around uh, the entire state in different pockets, uh, but you don't see charter schools there. Now, that is a legislative challenge. They would need to change the charter school law in Tennessee to allow those charters to go elsewhere. Uh, you can then also zoom in on the metro area, and when you do that, you find some areas within the metro area that have charter school deserts. And this is very common. You know, my hypothesis was that we were going to find a lot of these places in inner ring suburbs, and that certainly is the case. Because we know uh, from demographers that poverty in America has changed. Uh, it is no longer concentrated just in the big cities. It is spreading out, uh, and especially in places like D.C., like in Denver, that are booming and that are getting so expensive, there's a lot of gentrification happening, and low-income families are getting pushed out to the suburbs. Uh, and there's a big concern about this is that uh, many social service agencies are rooted in cities. And so uh, as the low-income populations move out to the suburbs, they don't have the same social service supports that they would have had if they were in the cities. And one of those, I would argue, would be high-quality charter schools. We have not managed to allow charter schools to follow uh, the families out to the suburbs in many cases. And we're going to talk about why that might be. Okay? So again, this is happening uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, and, you know, what we're hoping is that folks will look at the report and also a related map that I'll show you in just a second uh, to understand, you know, in your communities and in your states, where are these deserts? What's causing them? Is it something in policy? So, like Tennessee, Ohio, for example, has a law that basically makes it impossible to start a charter school outside the, the big eight districts, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, and so forth. Uh, and again, even though poverty now is happening out in the suburbs or in some other, you know, small cities, uh, you can't go there. Uh, or is it something else? Uh, is there no, maybe there's no, uh, you know, problem with the law, but maybe it's a funding issue. Robin Lake and her colleagues at the Center for Re Reinventing Public Education put out an article in Education Next uh, maybe a month or two ago looking at the Bay Area and what was happening there. And you know, as we all know, San Francisco, crazy expensive. Uh, now Oakland, crazy expensive. Uh, and low-income families were moving out to some of these other areas like Richmond, which is, is uh, right on the Bay, but uh, a low income suburb, but there were funders, philanthropists, who, you know, stated that, well, we only provide grants in San Francisco, or we only provide grants in Oakland. Uh, well, that's a big problem if, if the charter schools are saying, but the families that need our help are over in Richmond. Uh, and by the way, the facilities we can afford are over in Richmond. Then it's a matter of getting the philanthropists also to think metro area and not just about cities. Uh, so uh, we hope that this will spark those kinds of conversations. 
Uh, and uh, again, the uh, you know even though we have a lot of charter school growth, we still see these deserts. Uh, we've got to address the barriers uh, and and get beyond these city boundaries. Now let's take a look, Karen, if we can at uh, at the map. We have this cool interactive map where you can drill down. You can see uh, the charter schools in all these places. These dots are charter schools. You can also switch on a button so you can see the traditional public schools as well. Uh, and if you click on the dot, you can get all kinds of information about the school, including performance, uh, generally just proficiency rates, which is not great, but it, it's, it's something. Now, what you see in the DC area, or over here, uh, is, is pretty interesting. You, you see all these dots. These are the charter schools. And by the way, the dot, these are all elementary schools. Uh, we just looked at elementary schools for this study. All right, but you see a whole bunch uh, throughout DC. Uh, and then you look out into Prince George's County, where we know many, many low-income families live, and you see just a handful. I think right now in all of Prince George's, there are 11 charter schools. Uh, Washington, D.C., it's something like 120, right? Uh, yet, there are more low-income kids by far in Prince George's County, okay? If you look at the low-income kids in Prince George's and Montgomery and Fairfax, it's something like three times as many low-income kids in the suburbs as in the district right now. Okay, and yet very few charter schools. Now, you see the, the brown uh, areas are the, the high poverty neighborhoods. You know, by College Park, that's the University of Maryland, so ignore that. Uh, but you do see these other places, uh, you know, look to the right of Silver Spring. Those are places like Langley Park, Maryland, uh, where there is, you know, very high concentrations of poverty. This is where a lot of the, the MS-13 gang problems are, big, huge challenges Again, no charter schools. Similarly, over there by Landover, uh, and you can see some uh, in, in other spots too. You know, there's some around Alexandria, the, the Route 1 corridor. If we zoomed out, we'd see uh, some other high poverty spots up by Gaithersburg, Maryland. So the point is, in our metro area, there are a lot of low-income kids living in the suburbs, and they do not have access to the KIPP DCs uh, or the Center City Consortium schools or you know, these other fantastic schools that are changing lives in the city. And what can we do to change that? So uh, to talk about that, we've got a great panel. Why don't you come on up, and we'll get started. Okay. Good. We will start uh, to my far left with Joseph Hawkins. Uh, Joe is a retired study manager at West Hat, which is one of the big research firms uh, that does a lot of work on education and other social policy issues. But Joe is really here to talk about his experience as a volunteer who tried once upon a time to start a charter school in Montgomery County, Maryland, and lived to tell the tale. Uh, but we're going to hear all about that and the challenges uh, of starting a charter schools in the suburbs. Then we've got Robin Chait, who is the Director of Policy Development and Communications at the Center City Public Charter Schools. Uh, these are, uh, how, how many schools are we? we have six schools. Six schools uh, in D.C. These were the schools that used to be Catholic schools and converted to charter schools. This was now about five years ago? 2008. 2008, okay. <laughs> wow. Ten years ago. Oh, my God. Okay. I mean, this is a whole other fascinating story in its own right, uh, but we'll get into some of that. But, you know, to, Robin's here to give her perspective. She's also been, been following and writing about and studying charter schools uh, for many years. So to also give this perspective of, you know, sort of what would it take for a network in D.C. to think about going, you know, beyond the district. Uh, and then finally, Kimberly Sia, who gets the award for uh, being willing to travel the furthest. She is the CEO of KIPP Colorado. And we invited her here because KIPP uh, had been working exclusively in Denver and made the decision uh, to start a school, maybe several schools, well, we'll talk about it, several schools in the suburbs of Denver. Uh, again, as the, the patterns, residency patterns have, have shifted in that booming and gentrifying and getting extremely expensive city uh, out there in Colorado. So, uh, super excited to have you all here. Oops, I'm gonna ignore that. <laughs> Pretend that didn't happen. That was like a Marco Rubio moment there. I'm not going to reach. We all learn, don't reach for the water. <laughs> all right. So let's get into it. So first, Robin, um, get, you know, before we get into the D.C. specific discussion, what's your take on why we might see charter school growth slowing nationwide? 
Sure. Um, first, I think facilities are a major barrier. Um, real estate prices have increased dramatically in a number of urban markets, and charter schools just have less access to public facilities. So that's a huge challenge. Um, I also think political opposition has increased a lot over the last 10 years. I think when charters were just a fledgling movement, opponents didn't see the need to mobilize in the same way, and we're just seeing a lot more political opposition. There's also been a lot of negative um, media attention over the last 10 years. And I think that when you have a story about one bad charter operator or one bad charter school, it affects people's views of the charter sector in a way that is not the case for a traditional public school. I'm not sure why that is, but I really think that that's the case. And then um, I think in some urban districts, supply is starting to meet demand and the markets are getting saturated. And then um, the people in those districts, the charters in those districts are having to compete for scarce talent and resources and facilities. And so that's a challenge as well. Okay, great. Let, let, let me push on a few of these things because I'm curious. So. Uh, let's say this is all playing out here in the district itself. I mean, does that mean that we should then uh, acknowledge, okay, maybe we've hit the, the we've hit the the cap. I mean, we're not going to get bigger than fifty percent. Uh, it's just too hard to grow from here. Or are there ways to meet these challenges around, you know, the the politics, the publicity, the facilities? What's your take on that? I don't think we've hit the cap because there's still a lot of demands. I mean, there are a lot of students still on wait lists, especially for particular kinds of charter schools. I think the big barrier in DC is facilities and the cost of facilities. So philanthropists could fund a facility, could, right. could give us a facility and we could grow. <laughs> well, and it should be said, I mean, you know, the public put a lot of money into facilities uh, that are now owned by the District of Columbia Public Schools. Right. I mean, this is the in, in, in cities throughout the country that the pu traditional public schools own these buildings. In many cases, they've been beautifully renovated thanks to the in, in Ohio. There was, you know, the kind of a windfall from the tobacco settlement that funded a lot of school reconstruction. And uh, but many of those buildings are sitting half empty. Right. And so one question is how how can charters get access to those facilities? Of course, that exactly. is a political challenge for sure. I mean, there are 11,000 students on wait lists right now. Um, yeah. There are some duplicates, so that doesn't. Yeah. It's not a unique number, but yeah. certainly there's still excess demand, especially for particular schools. Yeah. I, I noticed you did not blame this exactly on Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos, but yeah, I mean, is that a factor? I don't think in D.C. No. Okay. I don't think so. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Just trying to make, get, get you some controversial <laughs> wrong. All right, Kimberly. Well, tell us about uh, what's happening out there in Denver. Walk us through what you and your team and your board uh, we're, we're thinking through when you made this decision, this big decision to go beyond uh, the city boundaries of Denver. So a couple of years ago, we were working uh, actually at the state level on some legislation around mill levy sharing in school districts. So in Colorado, all charter schools are first authorized by their school district. A school district may choose either to give up their authorizing rights um, or there may be appeal to the state board to be authorized by the Charter, um, charter School Institute. But really, because the school districts authorize the charter school, there's a lot of conversation about how much per pupil funding schools get. So in Denver, where our current six schools sit, we get equal share of mill levy funding as the district schools. And so that is great for us. It's We have a great relationship with the school district. It's been a wonderful relationship. But our board had kind of been talking about expanding outside of the city. And one of the biggest factors in doing that would be the per pupil funding. Um, it's between, depending on the district, it would be between two to $4,000 less than what we currently receive in Denver. And I will also share, for those of you who are here in DC, our per pupil funding in um, Denver is just around $10,000. I think you all get a little more than that here in DC. So um, that's a pretty big factor when you're starting to think about facilities. So as we're going through this process and, and we're really trying to help support the groups that are pushing for this uh, mill levy equalization across the state, we started to have families come to us and say, hey, I live in a suburb outside of Denver, and there's no charter schools in my city. And so I drive anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to two hours a day to come to KIPP. And as we started to talk to our families about this, we started to realize families who had lived in Denver were getting priced out of their homes and had moved to the outer ring suburbs 
And we're continuing to drive back and forth because the options in their city were, or towns were not the same as they were in Denver. And so we started to look at the numbers and we started to think about how many of our families is that really that live outside? And so we serve about 2,000 st students this year, and 10% of our students have a zip code that is not a Denver zip code. So we have families who are traveling um, many different distances to come to our schools. By the way, Kimberly, let, let, it, it's legal for them to do that, right, yes. in Colorado. Okay. It is, it is. <laughs> okay. So Colorado is an open enrollment state. Okay. You can go anywhere. Th there's a, a bit of a scandal that has, actually a big oh, scandal here with, with uh, suburban parents coming into D.C., uh, to, both to use charter schools, but, the, you know, they, there's been some question about that, but certainly there's now evidence that they were coming in to use the arts magnet uh, and not paying tuition as they're supposed to do. So, anyways, but all right, they were not breaking the law in doing this, but they, but this was a huge burden on these families uh, to travel all this way. So, the mill levy equalization passed, which was great news for us, because that means if a, if a city has a mill levy, we as charter schools would have access to that money in the same way district schools would. And so, we just started talking to the families um, outside of Denver, and they started calling their neighbors to house meetings. And the momentum started to grow. And so, you know, last December, our board said, you know what, let's move forward. Let's like choose a district and decide if this is the right, the right move for us. And so we took a look um, at Adams 14 School District, which is in Commerce City. It's a it's literally across a, a major road from Denver. It's 10 minutes from where our current schools are. So it's, and it's a whole different world. We have 90, over 92,000 students in Denver Public Schools. Adams um, 14 School District has about 7,000 students. The really interesting thing that we found though was that 30% of those students are not going to school in Adams 14. So that tells us something about what's happening in that city. There, there is a charter school in Commerce City. It is not authorized by the school district. Um, as a comparison point, in Denver Public Schools, about 7% of students don't go to Denver Public Schools. So that's a big difference. And so we're moving forward. We have a ton of parent support where we've been working with the community to really think about what kind of school that they would want for their, their children. And we're putting that together and we'll do our first application um, in a couple of months and we'll see what happens from there. Now, do you expect that most of the students will be low-income students, just like in Denver? We do, and that is namely because so many of them um, are either our own families who have already moved outside of the city, um, or families who live in their communities that um, serve, you know, we currently serve about 90% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch, and the demographics that we're, um, of the families we're working with are very similar. And so tell us more about the school district, though. So you now are, you're going to be sponsored, but authorized by, by Adam School District? We don't know. Okay. So we will put in a letter of in, intent in June. Um, the district, the one school district that currently sits in the city was authorized by the school district. Their performance um, in Colorado, we have a accountability clock school performance framework across the entire state. And so depending on a school's performance year over year, you can start to sit on what's called the accountability clock. So Adams is on their last year of the clock. And so they're in a status of needing to turn around. Depending on if they're able to do that or not, they may or not may or may not maintain their um, exclusive, exclusive authorizing authority and then that can or exclusive chartering authority and so that will help to, that will determine if they choose to authorize us or if we'll go to the state that's right that you can you can still there's a state option that, that is correct yeah. okay very helpful all right different experience uh, in montgomery county maryland joe tell us the tale uh, how did this all go down when you and another uh, other group of citizens were trying to get a charter school to serve low-income kids in montgomery i was wondering if just for a graphic, if Karen could put back up that map of Maryland so people will know where we're talking about. So th this is a history story and, and it goes back 20 years. And so 20 years ago, a group of us and one of the members, founding members, Julie Greenberg is in the audience. Uh, she was a teacher. Uh, so it's, it's a story about a group of teachers, parents, and community activists, and I consider myself an activist. At that, at that time, once upon a time, I, I had worked for the Montgomery County Schools, 
but but I was no longer employed with them. But oh, to come apart. Before it was the brown part was highlighted. Yeah, well, it's the neighborhood we wanted to set our school in was just slightly east of Silver Spring, between Silver Spring and College Park, um, one of the poor parts of Montgomery County. So our school board, um, at that time, there was no state law. Uh, the school board decided to pass a policy that allowed for charter school applicants to come forward and propose a school. That was, that was 1998. Uh, we got together in 1999, we submitted the first application. And uh, we viewed our school uh, at that time, a, a school mostly would focus on kids who were on farms, free and reduced meals, and they would be in that neighborhood. Um, just that pink area, just slightly um, east of Silver Spring a little north of Tacoma Park. Uh, we went through two formal applications over um, a four year, maybe a four and a half year period. Both of those applications were rejected. Uh, the second application, which we always think was a pretty strong application, was a partnership with the National Council of La Raza. And at that time, for those who can go back to the early 2000 part of that um, first cent um, decade, you know that La Raza had uh, grant money from both uh, the Walton and, and Gates Foundation to, with a mandate to open charter schools around the, around the country. And so we partnered with them on our second application. That um, unfortunately didn't seem to um, buy us a lot of street cred. Um, it, it didn't matter. Uh, now let me just say a, a, a few things about our proposed school. It was a small secondary school with um, grades 7 through 12 about 75 kids per grade, which would have ended up being about 450 students total. The school was going to be managed by, again, by teachers like um, Julie Greenberg. Uh, that, that seemed to be a bone of contention when, whenever we discussed our application, how can you manage the school with teachers? Um, but um, that, that, that was what we wanted to do, and that was our model. Um, it was going to be an at, um, international baccalaureate program. Um, and it would be school-wide. Montgomery County has a lot of, uh, only has one school that acts sort of as a magnet that is an IB school. But the difference between um, us and some of the other schools that had that option was we were going to be school-wide, but we were also going to make the requirement that if you came to that school, you chose to come to our school, you had to also sit for the, um, the diploma and graduate with the diploma, which is, which is a, a very high bar. Um, and again, it was located in East Silver Spring. Our, our school day was going to be nine to six, approximately. And Julie, if I'm getting any of these th things wrong, you can you can nick me afterwards. Um, and some Saturday um, sessions were required. So, why was our application rejected? Uh, there are a lot of reasons, and I'm sure we'll debate um, and talk about some of those in a while. But it, it was mostly rejected because they told us our school wasn't unique in any particular way. You're not, your school is not different. Well, it, you've, you're in Montgomery County now. Yep. You know that most secondary schools are probably two and now reaching 3,000 kids. And so our school was going to be the smallest, almost the smallest school in the county. Um, there, there is no school managed by teachers in Montgomery County, so I'm not sure why that wasn't unique. Um, Again, there are very few uh, Latinos and African Americans who are poor who are being challenged by IB um, diploma. So um, we thought that, that that was certainly a challenge that was not being offered. And, our, and, our, and, fr and frankly, our school schedule and school day was completely different. I mean, Montgomery County until recently was arguing about should they start at 8 o'clock. And um, you know, we were going to start at 9 o'clock, have a later school day. So that, that's, that's our experience in a nutshell. And again, the, you know, the important thing to know about Montgomery County uh, and really Maryland writ large is that it's up to the local school districts. It's the Correct. school boards who are the authorizers. Uh, and if they say no, 
there's no appeal process to the, the state. Right? There is an appeal process, and we did take some legal action, okay. but it, it's 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 a very high okay. bar. So. Right. And there, there's not another. The, the state board, for example, is not allowed to Correct. authorize charter schools. So there's not an independent charter school authorizer like there is in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and here we are 20 years later, still right now zero charter schools in Montgomery. Is that right? Yes. One came um, and went. One opened, and yeah. it opened and closed within a year. Yeah. Now, of course, um, I, I've said that it opened, and, and you mentioned that um, facilities, both of you mentioned that facilities are always a problem. Well, I, I believe that that charter school opened because it was in a closed a former, former elementary school. So they had a facility. Yeah. You know, if you don't have a facility, it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, now, again, around you go around the Beltway in, in Prince George's County, you've got 11 charter schools, uh, some of which, uh, my understanding, are serving more affluent kids, uh, some in the higher poverty parts of the county. You go around to the poor parts of Fairfax, Arlington, Alexandria, there's zero. Right? Virginia might have an even worse charter school law than Maryland's. I think there might not even be 11 charter schools in the entire state of Virginia. Uh, so we have these legal problems. So, <laughs> so maybe this this question is is moot then, Robin. But I guess I can't have to ask it still. You know what? What do you think it would take uh, for a Center City or DC Prep or a D Kip DC to think about giving this a shot uh, in one of these suburban districts where there's lots of low income kids? And and again, you look at the map where it might only be you know a mile or two miles from existing schools. I think we'd want an independent authorizer. Um, I think we'd be concerned that your experience would, would happen again, that the district would not be objective in reviewing applications. So certainly we'd want an independent authorizer. Um, we'd want autonomy over human capital. I know in both Virginia and in Maryland, um, teachers are subject, charter school teachers are subject to the personnel rules of the district. Um, I think one of the major assets of, of a charter school is that you have autonomy over human capital. You can hire the people who are fit for your school. You can have staffing structures that work for you. You can have evaluation systems that work for you. You can do professional development and compensation in ways that meet the needs of your school. So that's a huge barrier not to have autonomy over human capital. Um, and you'd want operational autonomy in general. Like you don't want to have to go through a district to accomplish certain things. You don't want to have to go through the district for a procurement. You don't want to have to go through the district for hiring. Otherwise, you know, why are you a charter school? Like the benefit of being a charter school is that you have the autonomy and the flexibility to be nimble and to do things that meet the needs of your students. So, you know, that then would lead us to conclude that in, in Maryland and in Virginia, what we need is some advocacy. Yes. Right? I mean, we've got to change <laughs> these charter school laws. Uh, and you look at D.C., again, and, and for 20 years, not only have we had all these charters, we've also had a very uh, effective advocacy uh, sector. Right? Yes. You've got uh, charter school associations. You've got other uh, nonprofits that are out there fighting for school reform at large, for charter schools in particular. You have this dynamic now where you, you can't run uh, to be the mayor of D.C. and be anti-charter. Right. Right. I mean, that would just be a non-starter. Partly that's because now you got 45 percent of the kids in charter schools. Right. But also because these organizations, you go out to Maryland and, you know, the, the Charter Association is, I think, staffed by one and a half people. Uh, you know, they're doing their best. Uh, there's a little bit more happening in Baltimore where that that district has been a little friendlier to charters, uh, but but not much. And so. Uh, so here's here's a question, you know, what what has driven advocacy in some places or at least fueled it is sometimes money, right? That that donors, philanthropists have said, you know what? We think charter schools are a great solution and we understand that these groups, you know, purporting supporting them need help. So how do we get the funders, the philanthropists who have poured so much money into DC, for example, to maybe be willing to put some efforts into getting a better charter law? In Maryland, so that we can, you know, have a shot at this again. I guess, you know, Kimberly, from your perspective, I mean, have you seen the philanthropists in Denver change their mind on this sort of thing? Are are they showing a willingness to go beyond the city boundaries? Yes and no. So the the bigger funders, you know. Um, especially national funders, have really selected the cities that they want to support. And so they they have stuck with, we're, we're supporting Denver. Not Denver Metro, but Denver. What we have found is this decision to expand outside of Denver has opened up funding opportunities with smaller uh, state foundations or family foundations that 
want to fund impact across the entire state. And so that's where we went first. We said, let's, let's find funders who, one, we haven't gotten money from in the past and tell them about this great new idea that we have. Um, and people have supported it. And that is where we have started. And that has given us some traction then to be able to go to some of our bigger funders who have said, we want to stay focused on the metro area, uh, or not metro area, but specifically on the city of Denver. And they have said, um, we haven't gotten there yet. They've said, let's see what happens. Let's watch and see what happens. And so it's a lot of conversations. It's really thinking about what are the key components of our program that we might be able to, to loop people in. So serving early childhood education. If you're a funder who really cares about early childhood education, you're only funding it in Denver right now. We're talking about, but those families don't live in Denver. They're moving outside of Denver, and those are still kiddos who need early a great early childhood education option. So could you help us fund that portion of it? And that is... Getting us some traction. Can we name names here on the national funders? <laughs> Whose I, mind do we need to? I mean, are we talking <laughs> Walton, Charter School Growth Fund? We actually haven't talked to Charter School Growth Fund yet, so okay. that is a okay. good question. Okay. Um, I think Walton has been yeah. pretty yeah. targeted in what who they've been, cities yes. they've been choosing to fund. All right, Walton, we're looking at you guys. No, I mean, this is where we've, we've got to try to change some minds. And and look, the good news is these funders, I, I have found, have been great over the years of, of changing their minds. It used to be, for example, that they would say, we only want to fund charter schools that are 90% poverty you know, 90% minority. Uh, and then some people started saying, but hey, that means that you can't start a diverse charter school. And a lot of us want to start a charter school that's diverse by design. And that would be a good thing. And and they've come around on that to say, okay, yeah, actually that does make sense. So maybe this is just, we need to help make the case that, hey, for sure, keep supporting charter schools in DC, but all, you know, all the poor kids live out in Prince George's County and Montgomery and Fairfax. So maybe do that too. Okay. Good. Any more thoughts on that, too? Well, I, I think there, there, you, there are two parts. The, the advocacy is two parts. One is, yes, Maryland needs to change this law. That, that's, that's, a, that's a really heavy pull. But going back to the funding issue, I think that Montgomery County, for example, has always been absent of what, what I've called someone who's a, that's a poor, it's the only thing that's coming into my head, so I'll use it. We haven't, we've never had a sugar daddy. We've never had someone who has a lot of money, a lot of capital, who can push and force things to happen. Not, not that we uh, are lacking for billionaires. Oh, we have, we have, we have, we have a whole bunch. Yeah. So let, let me just give an example. So um, when charter schools first came to um, Washington, um, there was a Marriott um, charter in D.C. I, I think it's closed, right? Yeah, it, I think it so. closed. But it was a hospitality yes. charter. Okay, so right now Montgomery County is um, bending over backwards, well, already bent over backwards, and we're allowing Marriott Corporation to stay in Montgomery County. It's one of the largest corporations in the world, and it resides in, in, in our county, and, we're build, and they're building a new headquarters. Well, you know, I, it would have been nice if they had said, okay, we're going to build a new headquarters, and we want a hospitality charter here. No one would have said no to them if they had decided they wanted a hospitality charter. But there's no one that's pushing that kind of agenda. And, and I think that, that that's one of the key things that's missing. I don't suppose that's in our Amazon proposal either. Probably not, <laughs> but that would be another opportunity. Uh, we're going to open up to questions in just a moment, so if you've got some, uh, please think about them. And I should have said, you know, I, I've been so dear, I haven't looked at Twitter once this whole time, it's so unlike me, uh, but I even forgot to mention the hashtag, which is... Uh, Thank you. Charter Deserts. Charter Deserts. Hopefully, I'll go see if people are tweeting. Because you can tweet at hashtag Charter Deserts, and I'll look at that now and get those questions, too. Okay. Uh, yes, let's get the mics out, and we'll get, uh, get some questions here and then over here. Really fascinating. By the way, what, do you know, are there any other examples of... of networks expanding to the suburbs that you're aware of? Yes, so Aurora it was actually the first suburb that I would say people started to expand to outside of Denver. So DSST Public Schools and Rocky Mountain Prep have both, um, Rocky Mountain Prep currently has a school there, and then DSST is um, 
working on a building to have a school there as well. So this is not a new conversation in Denver. I think ha the friendliness of the district to charters, as well as the availability of facilities, both those networks I just named got facilities as part of it. Um, and so that makes it a lot easier to move outside of Denver. Yes, sir. Uh, tell uh, us who you are and uh, ask a question. Uh, my name is Sheldon Fishman. I'm a huge proponent of public schools uh, and charter schools. Yep. Um, and so the question is uh, to, to change the, uh, look for an opportunity to change the tone of anti-public school and ask, what about the public schools where they are actually proponents of charter schools, um, like Philadelphia? What's the difference um, between there um, and Montgomery County? And, and while I have a mic, I, I mentioned there's, there's a... Uh, a small school in Montgomery County that has lots of Montgomery County kids in it um, that has um, does great uh, service for dyslexic kids and is having great success. It's everything a charter school in Montgomery County should be, but it ain't. Yeah, it, but it's, it's, it's private. Is it a private school? Sienna School yeah, right. down the street from me. Yeah, yeah. Robin, you willing to take this question? Sort of when, where, where we see. I think what we're getting at is where we see school districts being open to charter schools and being good partners. I mean, there are yeah. examples of those. And, and how can we get the Montgomery counties of the world to be open to that? We actually have a partnership with the traditional pu public school. Um, we have a program called ESL After the Bell, um, which is targeted academic instruction for English language learners after school. And we received a dissemination grant from the Office of the State Superintendent of Education to share it with the traditional public school. So H.D. Cook Elementary School is now implementing the ESL After the Bell program. So we're open to partnering with traditional public schools. Um, it helps to have financial incentives because it takes time. It's, it takes a lot of effort. Um, but certainly, yeah, we're open to certainly partnering with, with traditional public schools. Sheldon, I, I was going to say that perhaps there needs to be some kind of effort where, um, piggybacking on what she has just said, that sort of has some kind of formal relationship that mentors Montgomery County people, school system people, because what I think what Julie and I found when, when we were trying to do this is that even though we're, we're literally only miles apart, it's almost impossible to even get a school board member in your car and drive into the DC, in, into DC and say, let's visit this charter school. Uh, you know, and maybe, m maybe there needs to be something a little more formal to make that happen. Yeah, I and mean, look, and, and, and let's also be honest, I mean, it, it is still rare to find those traditional public schools open to this, in part because they hear charters and they think it's anti-public education. They see it as, as questioning, you know, well, why do we need these charters? We can do uh, all this good work ourselves. Or they're worried about losing, you know, enrollment or money or or all the political stuff. You know, in places where the traditional public schools have been friendly, like in Denver, you know, it's usually been because there's been real advocacy work to elect school boards who are charter friendly. Uh, and but that's a long term and expensive uh, and hard proposition. I would also say that um, a lot of the partner organizations in DC work with both traditional and charter schools. So we're all kind of learning the same things and using the same partners. Like for instance, Urban Teachers and ANET and Flamboyant. So we're all using a lot of the same strategies and learning from each other and doing that. Okay, yes. Hi, thank you. My name is Leah Cruzzi. I run a political action committee called Allies for Educational Equity. And thank you, first of all, to Fordham for getting this paper out. This is something that has been bugging me for years now. Great. Um, there's this, there, I see, I work in advocacy. Our, there's been a political cost to having gone deep over wide. Mm -hmm. And um, so my first question will be for you, Kimberly, um, that there's a strategic reason for going deep over wide, that there's economies of scale. Let's get good at starting schools and figuring out how to serve children and families really well. Um, and then there's also a transaction cost and operational cost to going wide over deep in that there's different regulatory environments. So my question for you, and I'll state the questions really quick, because this one for you and one for you. Um, the, for, for you is, even though there is open enrollment um, across district boundaries, do you anticipate some operational challenges in the regulatory environment um, it, as it, should you be able to open a school in a suburban area? Could be little things. It could be bigger things like pension obligations, health care costs. Um, second question but is... Let's start with that, and then we'll... Yeah. yeah. Okay, All right. Yeah. So, 
from an operational perspective, I think that the biggest cost that we're expecting is the services that we currently receive from Denver Public Schools. We don't foresee those being an option, even if we are authorized by the school district that we're currently looking at. Um, that includes transportation services, food service, uh, and facility access. And so there's a huge cost there that we're really having to think about. From a regulatory perspective, the State has a pretty strong charter statute, and so requirements for charters are really dictated across the entire state through that statute. And then depending upon each of the individual district needs, there's some shifts. So for example, Denver Public Schools um, is under a consent dec decree with the Department of Justice um, around how we teach our English language learners. So there are certain requirements that we as a charter school authorized by the district have to follow in the same way that any traditional um, district school would have to follow as well. And so we we haven't, we don't foresee that there would be any um, difference there from what we're already dealing with. What I will name, I think, in that idea of like going deep versus going wide, we can do that because we've been around for 15 years, we have six schools, we have a staff, that we can go out and make that happen. If I was a single site charter and this was my first run at it, it would be so much harder for, for many, many reasons. And I think the funder piece comes into that as well because funders are not getting behind this in the same way um, that they do in, in, in more um, distinct urban areas. It just makes it a huge challenge. So we feel fortunate to be able, it's a risk and we're willing to take that risk right now. Yeah, and I guess it's one thing to cross city boundaries. It's a whole other thing. Like here, actually going to another state uh, is, is going to be much more uh, complicated. Yeah. All right. What's your second question? The second question is, in, it was so interesting to hear that the charter law or resolution was initiated out of the LEA level rather than the SEA level um, and yet rejected two rounds of what I'm quite sure was an excellent application. Um, do you have any knowledge of how that came to be that it was led by the district and did they end up approving anyone? Oh, since they first put the policy in place, I believe and I think my count is correct, there have been maybe four complete applications um, and one has been approved and that school closed after a year saying they didn't have enough funding in 20 years. Uh, the cynical side of me wants to say that looking back on, on, on that period of time that, that the policy w at the LEA level was passed partly as a way of, of saying, oh, look at us, we passed a charter school law um, or a charter school policy. But uh, there never seemed to be the number of votes on the, on the board at any particular time to actually approve a school. So Joe, I, I'm not exactly sure why. I, I mean, I, I don't think I paid that much attention to the why behind the initial policy. Yeah. I, I'm curious, Joe, what, if, would anything convince, uh, you know, the board and the senior staff at Montgomery County to give this a look? Like, for example, we now have Maryland schools and D.C. schools taking the same test, taking PARC. You know, we can look and see, do high poverty schools in D.C. outperform Montgomery County's high poverty schools? Right. Well, Would that convince anybody? Um, I'm not, well, probably not because Montgomery County as a total still, and, and for those who live in the, in the region, if, if you pick up the Washington Post, for example, and, and there's an article about Montgomery County schools, Montgomery County schools are still described as a high performing school district. So Montgomery County schools see themselves in that way. They see charter schools as something that an inner city um, school district does to reform itself. So why would we want to go in that direction? It might, it might make people think that we're not um, still high performing. But you said something, Mike, that, that the district is struggling with, and the map is still not there, but the, the district is, is extremely um, segregated. Um, and, and I think both of us, we live in the western part, which is predominantly white, the schools. If you go to the schools, they're predominantly white, high, you know, very affluent. And, and in the eastern part of the county, it's just the opposite. And, and the, schools current, the school district currently 
is struggling with the the morality of that. Uh, and 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 what and you mentioned that could you open a charter that would bring about diversity? Yeah. Because while Montgomery County is struggling with the issue, the moral issue, they're not really going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But um, but but a charter school would offer a solution as as something you could do to actually bring it about. You know, we we did it. We did it in this school. Look. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Nancy. Like a footnote that really is more the lead. And it's about the fact that even if a charter in Montgomery County were to be successful, it would be strangled in the crib. And I, as evidence of that, I would say that um, the State Board of Education in Maryland uh, resolved our, on an appeal from the Jaime Escalante charter school applicants and forced Montgomery County to negotiate on a charter school, not with us, but with some other charter school entity. And Jerry Wiest picked Kip. Kip came forward and then pulled back. They pulled back because they realized they could never operate under Jerry Wiest and the MCPS bureaucracy. And I don't think the situation has changed. I think if there, if there was to be something approved, there would be so much undermining that the charter itself, for its own preservation, would pull back. Okay, uh, over here, and then uh, Susan in the front. Yeah, here, Emily on over here. Yep. I, I do wonder, by the way, you know, in, in these other metro areas where the inner ring suburbs tend to be, you know, all these tiny little districts, some of which are very high poverty. I wonder how this plays out. You think about the suburbs of Chicago, for example, where, uh, you know, the, does that make it easier or does that make it harder? I mean, we've got this dynamic where Montgomery County serves 150,000 kids and sprawls all over the place and has a lot of affluence and then these pockets of poverty. And, and that's part of the dynamic. Okay, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm a GW student. Um, I'm doing my thesis on the supply and demand of charter schools. Ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently at Building Hope as well in DC. And uh, my question is, um, when it comes to the real estate aspect, do you think that uh, in the DC metro area, the biggest hurdle is, is it available? Is it finding available space? Or is it that there is available space, there just isn't enough financing for those spaces? Um, I think it's both. Um, I think the, the cost of, is prohibitive. Um, we're fortunate in that we do have a facilities allowance in DC. We have $3,000 per student, but it's not enough to pay um, the market rate for rent. So you'd have to use some of your per pupil funding, which you don't want to do because you, you want to use that funding to provide programming for your, for your students. You don't want to use it for facilities. And in Montgomery County, I think that one of the problems is is the view of what a school is. And so I think you could get a, a less expensive school if people thought of schools differently, but we can't think of schools differently. So if, if a new high school comes online, it has to exist on 25 acres. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's, you know, 25 acres, I mean, give me a break. Um, so it, I, I'm agreeing, it's both, both of those issues. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's great, like you could imagine uh, a place like uh, all the development that's happening in Montgomery County, you could do with what they did with Oyster many years ago in D.C., yes. right, where you, you knock down the school, a developer builds a big new condo building, and a school at the bottom of it, yep. renovated, beautiful, you know, some yard out back. Uh, and it's a win-win, and I think that might not have cost D.C. a penny. Uh, you know, you could have Montgomery County could be doing the same thing uh, as, as yep. it needs more uh, schools and facilities. Okay, we got Susan in the front, and then we got some folks in the back. The baby wants to ask a question. Is that right? <laughs> Hi, Susan Sclafani, uh, former U.S. Uh, Department of Ed person. In, I come from Houston, and I, I, there are several things in Houston that, that I wanted to mention. One is that even with a state board authorizer, I'm now on a new charter school board that had applications in five times in five years, almost identical applications with scores from 105 suddenly down to 86, 
without any real explanation. But anyway, one of the things that is working in the Houston area, not only in Houston Independent School District, but in Spring Branch, is when uh, KIPP or YES have gone into low-performing, low enrollment schools and have started charters in those schools with an agreement to share best practices. Have any of you considered that as an option for expanding into facilities that aren't costly? Yeah, co-locations. Uh, it's interesting. It has worked in Houston. Of course, it's a total dirty word in New York City uh, where people seem to hate it. But what, what, what's your take on that? So co-location is a strategy that has been used in Denver as well. Um, there's been a phase-in, phase-out model that's been used for turnaround, and so we actually had a middle school. One of our middle schools was in that model where we came in to a family middle school and grew our model starting in fifth grade up to eighth grade, and that mo the other model phased themselves out. So we've done that before in Denver as well. It, we would be more than willing if a district would want to give us a facility to do that. We have experience with it. It is successful. Oftentimes, too, it's a great way to partner with the community to say, look, like, this is your same school. You get to be, you're in the same building. We're not, we're not coming in to take over. We're coming in to really help and support and do what's best for kids. What about maintaining both schools, public school and the charter, in the same location? That would be wonderful. And I know it's worked really well, especially in Spring Branch, um, with the partnership at Sky that they have down there. And that would be something that we would definitely be willing to explore. Okay. To the baby in the back. Hey, um, so my name is Greg Woodward, and I'm uh, in the very early stages of working to start a knowledge-centered elementary charter school somewhere in the DMV area. Great. Uh, and uh, I should say, I'm looking to sort of just seek advice generally on what you might say to someone who's working as a single authorizer at this point, or a single one-off school trying to do something really new on how to tackle the challenges of trying to open up either in Montgomery County or in Prince George's County. Um, you know, I'm, I'm neutral as to uh, the exact jurisdiction that it opened up in, but I'm committed to the mission of trying to reach uh, you know, pockets of poverty, so um, kids that need better schools. So just what advice would you give to someone trying to do that? Joe? Well, I mean, I would talk to the people who have gone through the application process in Montgomery County. There's not a lot of us, but, <laughs> but um, I think you can track us down and we would give you advice. Uh, um, I, I think when in, in the early stages of, of us seeking advice, we came to people in D.C. because that, that D.C. is the mecca. So um, if, if you want to know what uh, the, the nuts and bolts of what your charter school should be about, you need to establish some relationships with individuals in D.C., I would talk to parents in the communities that you are targeting and find out what they want and what they need and try to build a demand because that will help you politically as well. Anything else? No. That's, that's exactly the strategy that we have tried to that we have been using as well is it's about it's about kids and families and so it's often it's really easy to say no to one of us sitting up here. It's a lot harder to say no to kids and families. That's well said. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. So, um, hi, is this on? Um, I'm uh, Naomi Rubin DeVoe. I'm the deputy director of the DC Public Charter School Board. Um, I live in Montgomery County. I actually live, Joe, in your neighborhood, and we worked together when I was at yeah, Focus. Yeah, we did. Yes. Um, but she's not stalking you, Joe. Yeah. That's not at all. <laughs> not. Um, and uh, the, the middle school in that area is now IB, um, trying to uh, probably appease what you started, but it's 2000s kids, and my son goes there, and I would love a charter. Um, what I'm wondering, because this is very near and dear to my heart, I would love to see uh, charters and, and I, uh, in Prince George's County and Montgomery County because I'm watching the, the demographics change. Um, when I look back at DC and how we started, the first charter schools were like Carlos Rosario, which is an adult ed school, and um, Bria, which is a school that's built off of Mary Center and um, for immigrant families, mother. They're very... Um, not threatening to the district. And I look at Montgomery County, I look at Prince George's County, and I look at our strategy and think, why aren't we, Mary Center is huge in Montgomery County, why aren't we working with those um, that have political power and funding and saying, look, we'll build a charter school for your niche population, we're not threatening, 
And we start building, because that's what happened in D.C. And we didn't have KIPP in the beginning, or any K-12. And whenever we're running into a hard place politically, we start chartering alternative schools and ones that, again, aren't threatening DCPS. Um, so that's sort of my question, and I, I don't really have an answer, and I don't know if, you know. No, I, and I'd love I, to help. I, 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 to I totally agree with you, but, of course, I do have a but, and that is, all right, it, you know um, Casa de Maryland, right? Well, you know, through their I-3 um, U.S. Department of Ed grant money, they were going to open two high schools. They are opening two high schools. I think one of them is open. Um, but I think they they took that route. I've never had a conversation about the politics, but I'll bet they took that route because they wanted to avoid taking the route of becoming a charter school, opening two charter schools. They, they're, they're opening those schools as regular alternative high schools under PG. And wouldn't they have been better if they were charters? I mean, I, I'm thinking they, they didn't take the charter school route because of the political challenges. And the political challenges are, you know, both of, both of these counties, PG as well as Montgomery, the, for example, the NAACP is not going to support you. But I, I don't know, but it still sounds like a very interesting strategy. Yeah, it is. And to think I, about what... I agree. Yeah, what, what would those niche populations be or what would the kind of proposals... Uh, again, particularly in places maybe where, where either of these counties are, are really busting at the seams and, and don't have, you know, are struggling to keep up with enrollment growth. I mean, we certainly have seen over the years that charter schools, it's got a foothold. It was easier in places like Arizona that at one point it was growing like gangbusters and, you know, it was helpful to the traditional public schools. They couldn't build buildings fast enough. So if you were going to take 500 kids, that made their life easier. You know, there might be some... Uh, places like well, that as there, well. There are. I mean, there, there are places. I, I mean, that, that's a good point. You know, take these 500 kids off our hand. Okay. So, <laughs> so if you, I, I don't know, have, have you ever gone up to the University of Maryland of Shady Grove during the daytime? Mm -hmm. It's empty. Yeah. Sheldon, have you ever been up there in the daytime? It's empty, right? All kinds of real estate, all kinds of buildings. Why can't we have a, a school without walls there? That's a charter school. Does it have to be without walls? I really like walls. I don't know. That's, that's, that's well, you, you, it's the concept. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Sarah Marr. I work with uh, State Strategies with Connections Education, and I'm a big proponent of charter schools, but also virtual charter schools, which brings me to a question. I've heard a lot about um, the facilities being a barrier, cost being a barrier, and so this year we recently saw a an online charter school option become a parent in DC with Friendship Public Charter um, opening an online option now. And so my question to you is how do you anticipate online learning options potentially being a solution for some of the issues that you've been discussing today? Um, and then also obviously some barriers that are going to be evident and in place. Maryland and Virginia also lots of barriers, but. Anybody? And to be clear, we don't have to necessarily agree with the uh, with the argument of the questioner, right? Uh, Ed Week article today about how in uh, five different states, online charter schools are, are closing. And some of us would argue that it's about time that some of those schools are very low performing. Uh, but are we hopeful about online learning, especially for, uh, you know, high, high poverty populations? I think in Maryland, you'll have to change the law. I think the law right now says no online schools, charter schools. Um, I don't think there's evidence that those schools have been effective for low-income families. Um, certainly, you could have a blended model, and those um, models have been more effective. But yeah, I don't think that there's sufficient evidence that virtual schools are effective. OK, so you got to be careful what you ask. Right? That's <laughs> I just, all right, yes. Oh, over here, OK. Here uh, and then here. Yeah. Um, on the question of facilities, in particular in Montgomery County, I think Joe is being too kind to Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, we have lots of uh, former schools that are closed. There are uh, three of them within a, a half a mile of my house on east uh, part of the county. Uh, we just tore down the Dennis Avenue Elementary School. Um, we have, in, in co-locations, the local high, middle school um, I, I, within walking distance of my house already has co-location, but it has co-location for office space. So we're, we have um, 
office space being used some of this place, and uh, and, a, and a Taylor Saturday School is being used, which is of course not being used during the day. So there's um, and we have lots of um, high rise um, office space empty um, in Montgomery County. So there's facilities. I think is not um, um, the as big a obstacle to getting charter schools in Montgomery County. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I just wanted to say, Sheldon, I, I agree. We agree, but but then I'll, I'll add that it's still that perception from the school board yeah. that that kind of school in that facility, which we put quotes around, is, is um, deteriorating and, and inferior. Mm -hmm. We don't want it. Yeah, I can just see their heads exploding thinking about a, a school in a high rise. How could you have a school in a high rise? Well, go around the country. It happens, right? Uh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, last question in the back corner. All right, we'll go over to here and here. Yeah. My name is Rob D. Simone. I'm uh, trying to start a charter school here in the district. Hopefully, to open in, in 2020. Um, but uh, my question is a bit bigger in context. It goes back to the uh, to the sugar daddy <laughs> comment that we had before. Um, which is I, you know, previously I ran an after-school program and for about four years in the district, and uh, even in the past four years, I've seen a lot of those families move either kind of fracture towards Montgomery County or towards Prince George's, and um, this this comment about you know there, there's never really been any kind of private philanthropy in earnest in Montgomery County, I think is compelling because there's certainly a lot of potentials, um, but I was just was want a little more detail about. Um, what efforts have, have gone on, especially maybe in the past five or ten years, to try and convene some of those folks? Um, however few or, or extensive they are, I uh, certainly would be curious to know what, what kind of forums certainly exist. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know much about the philanthropic scene in Montgomery County, Maryland, or if anybody's ever reached out to some of the those super affluent folks about supporting charters. I mean, I, you know, look, I think that a lot, you know, the, the challenge may be you would go to them and say, we need these charters, and they'd say, hey, you know, have you looked at the General Assembly in Maryland? I mean, it's, you know, with a Democratic supermajority or close to it, it's a really tough lift, right? And at the, you know, the Maryland Teachers Association is, is a huge political force. So, you know, you would, you know, we wouldn't, we would need to be able to convince them that this battle though it might take years, was, was winnable. And that'd be the challenge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, um, my name's Chris Curry, and um, I, I wanted to stay to the end because I'm actually not, I don't have a question about charter schools per se, but we're all kind of in the same boat of trying to serve, you know, under served and underprivileged populations uh, improve outcomes. And uh, I actually work for a Catholic school, St. Jerome Academy, uh, in, in one of the charter school deserts in Prince George's County. And uh, my daughter, who's a graduate of the school, is now studying to be a teacher. She's in Ohio, and uh, um, she wants to teach in the DC public school environment. Um, so we, I think we're all kind of working towards the same goal, but I think it's important to acknowledge the role that Catholic schools do play. Now, we are we are a school that is challenged because we have to charge tuition and we're in a community that is not uh, that affluent. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, after we adopted uh, a curriculum we wrote ourselves uh, nine years ago, uh, our school has, has gone from being under enrolled to being completely full. And this year we have made the decision to expand. We've added two a pre-K and a kindergarten class and we'll continue to add classes all the way up. We don't have any money. We don't know where the money is going to come to actually create the space for these students, but we have more than 200 applicants a year, uh, currently 330 students, so we, we have to do something to serve these students. Uh, we're half students of color, um, many non-Catholic students. Um, we educate these students for less than half of the cost of the public schools in Prince George's County, $7,600 versus $16,000. Um, currently now there's a boost program in Maryland, which is still small, but um, it covers about half of the cost for us. We cover the rest. So we're taking on 12 more Booth students this mm -hmm. next school year, but we have to find the money then to pay for. So what can the public policy community, what can the philanthropic community do to help us all work together yeah. to fill these deserts? 
Now, I'm glad you, you made that point. Uh, we have a blog post up at our website at Fordham by Kathleen Porter McGee. He used to be at Fordham and now runs the partnership schools in New York City. And she wrote a great post pointing out that in many metro areas, if you go and look at the charter school deserts, there actually is a Catholic school there uh, serving low income population. Uh, now, in some places, uh, they are able to do so uh, thanks to school voucher programs or tax credit programs. But in a lot of places, uh, they're, <laughs> they're doing it, uh, just figuring it out some other way, uh, and it's a it's challenge. Robin, any thoughts? I mean, you've watched this. You know, Here, here we had a situation in D.C. where there was a, a voucher program, and it still wasn't enough money uh, to keep the, the center city schools as Catholic schools. Uh, the decision was made to go to charter. You could get a whole lot more money and, and support that way. Uh, what, what do you think? Um, well, all I'll say is that, you know, our schools had to convert to charters in order to remain sustainable. Um, and the, the student population changed when we converted to charters. So our student population is about 90% free and reduced price lunch, about 70% African-American uh, quarter Hispanic. Um, so we're serving um, a lower income population after the conversion. I'm sure there were, there were low income families that we were serving when, when we were Catholic schools, but we're able to serve uh, obviously a higher low income population because we're, we're free to all students. Um, don't have additional thoughts about that. But, uh, you know, look, and, and again, certainly you won't get any arguments from me. I mean, at Fordham, we, we support all forms of, of parental choice. And, and this is, you know, one, one dream would be that someday we'd get to the point where if you're a low-income child, it doesn't matter whether you go traditional public or charter or Catholic or other private schools, that, you know, the money will follow you there so those schools can serve you. Now, my view is there should be on the flip side some accountability for results, make sure that they're, uh, you know, that those schools are doing well. But uh, no, but thank you for what you're doing because it's incredibly hard and you're doing it on a shoestring. Uh, and, and it's another sign that Maryland's policy environment is a big challenge and a big problem. Ideas afterwards. <laughs> uh, I'm at St. Jerome Academy in Hyattsville and yeah. love to hear any, any thoughts. All right. Well, great. Well, let's let that be the last word. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panel. Uh, the video will be up on our website probably by tomorrow, so please tell friends and family to go check that out if they didn't have a chance to see that. If you are here, please help us eat some of the breakfast and drink some of the coffee that is out there uh, to your right when you leave. And uh, look out for our next study, which is going to be on Catholic schools, uh, coming uh, before the month is out. All right. Thanks, everybody.